Welcome to the Butterfly Effect. I'm Chris Horner. This is Tour of the Basque Country, Stage 2, 207 kilometers, about 130 miles in length. It's going to be a very long race. Now, there's a couple climbs in here, three total, and the last climb is over 12 kilometers at about 3%, with some sections at 7%, but not a very difficult climb, even though it comes 35 kilometers from the finish of today's stage. It's just not hard enough to really going to blow it up. What is more interesting about today's stage is they're finishing in Vienna, and the year when I won the Basque Country, I'm familiar with this finish because we did it, we finished in this town that year too when Alejandro Valverde won that stage. Now, today's stage, a little bit different finish than the year when I won the Basque Country in 2010, but this drag is still the same. So I can tell you it was a hard, legitimate drag up to the line, but still kept the group more or less intact when we went up to the finish. Not a point in time that I would want to be on the front of the peloton though, driving it up this finishing climb if I'm trying to hold general classification. Now keep that in mind because the finish of this stage is pretty exciting. When we get into the stage and it starts proper, four riders up the road, four Basque riders, and four Spanish teams up there all represented. Now, they have a four-minute lead, and these four riders, Iban Ruiz from Kern Pharma, Anders Okamika from Burgos BH, Julian Armasqueta from Caja Royale, and Ibai Azurmendi from Escatel Eskidi. These four riders only have a four-minute gap on the peloton being led by Yumbo Visma and Quick Step back there. Now, with these two teams on the front, only a four-minute gap, and we're 75 kilometers still to go on a 207-kilometer stage. I'm really thinking this is a sleep stage. This is a stage where I thought I'd have to come up here and talk to you guys and talk about how all the riders back there are chatting with each other, trying to get the kilometers counting down any way they possibly can because these stages were always hard on me. I, I kind of hated these stages. They're a little boring. You fall asleep the whole time. And really, the only action that I saw from 75 kilometers all the way to the climb starts around 35 kilometers to go was with about 65k into it Garrett Thomas almost crashed overlapping one of the wheels of the I believe the Yumbo Visma rider in front of him and that was a little bit of a scary moment for Garrett Thomas but that was it there was nothing else happening it was a sleeper I thought this stage was wrapped up and was just going to be a field sprint at the finish but remember, it's 2022 here in bike racing, and so there's always some excitement to have and to keep an eye out when you're watching bike racing in this, in this year of 2022 and 2021. So when we get into the climb with 35 kilometers to go, the gap is about a minute and 45 seconds up to the four liters. At points and times throughout this stage, with 50 kilometers to go and 40 kilometers to go, the gap had gotten even down to one minute. But when the climb starts, the peloton had eased up before that, and the time gap is about 145. And then we're going to see more events saving off from Quick Step. He throws an attack on this climb. That will bring the time gap up to the four liters severely down, and now it's only a minute and 15 seconds. I'm sure when you're looking at more events saving off from Quick Step, his attack there, probably trying to ignite something to happen in the field. It doesn't. Everything calm back down, and that gap balloons back up. Now, when they reach the KOM, it's the Kern Farmer rider, Ibon Ruiz, who steals the KOM points, and he'll get the jersey when the stage is finished and wrapped up after today. But there's still some excitement. When they went over the top, that time gap had started to balloon. Now, with 20 kilometers to go, that time gap's at two minutes. And right there, when you're looking at the field back there, they're still spread across. No one team is really driving it on the front. I'm still not worried, but I'm concerned. At 20 kilometers to go, four riders, two minutes, that's a doable time. But that is now all of a sudden giving some, some kind of hope up there to the four breakaway, breakaway riders. Now, with 15 kilometers to go, that gap is still over two minutes, and the peloton still isn't chasing. At this point in time, when I'm sitting on the couch, I'm thinking these four riders are gone. This race is wrapped up and the four Spanish riders up front look spectacular for one of the four being able to grab the stage race victory here. Now, what I'm thinking about, Yumbo Visma, who's not chasing at this point in time, this is a fantastic tactic. Let's go ahead and give the jersey away. And I don't want you guys to mix up what happened last year here in the Basque Country when Yumbo Visma with Primoz Roglic gave the jersey away on stage four to Brandon McNulty, UAE Team Emirates. 
This is a completely different scenario than when I was arguing those tactics on stage four of giving the jersey away versus arguing here on stage two. When you give it away to one of the four small Spanish teams up front, you know Primos Rogos can grab that jersey back on one of the mountain stages to come. And we are very early here in the Basque Country. So Yumbo Visma have no reason to chase. When I look at Quick Step back there with 15 kilometers to go and the peloton still curb to curb, I'm thinking to myself, why would Quick Step need to chase? They don't have to chase. Why bring Primos Roglic to the line and give Primos Roglic a chance at winning another stage here on stage two early in the Basque Country and possibly gain more time bonuses on Remco Evnepoel, who's sitting second on the general classification. So I love these tactics back here from the big teams, Quick Step and Yumbo Visma. And now I'm asking myself, why doesn't a team like AG2R understand what's happening here and start getting on the front and just drilling it like crazy? Remember, they have a very good sprinter back there in Andre Vendami, and he is known for winning sprints like this. When you look at the Basque Country, I told you guys yesterday, there's no pure sprinters here. There's no pure hard roller guys. There's all GC guys that can climb. So if you got any kind of speed like Julian Alaphilippe does, but why go to the line with Primoz Roglic? Then when we look at other riders like Sergio Aguita from Bora Hansgrohe, I'm thinking, hey, this is an opportunity for Sergio to possibly be able to win a stage. We've seen him on good form here already in 2022. But AG2R is really the team that I'm thinking about at this moment with 15 kilometers to go. You guys better get on the front and start chasing. It's still not happening yet. Now with 13 kilometers to go, to my disbelief, I can't imagine what's happening. The group of four up there decide to start playing games. It's Julian from Caja Royal and Ebay from Escatel Eskidi, and you see them get in a discussion. Now, when they do, that means that this group of four is not gelling, and they should be. They got to go all the way to the line. Next split second, all of a sudden, we're going to see the Kern Farmer rider go up the road. He's throwing in a massive dick. Now, if you're Ivan Ruiz right now from Kern Farmer with only 49 seconds back on the general classification, the gap was still at about two minutes at this point in time with 13 kilometers to go while he's taking a flyer. This is a perfect tactic. If the group back there won't pull, if Caja Royale rider will not take a pull, our Mesqueta there just won't come through. You gotta attack. It's 13 kilometers to go. Now, the problem is, Two minute gap back to the Peloton is a fantastic gap if you got four guys rotating through. But if you're just one guy up the front trying to go solo and you got a Peloton back there that all of a sudden will decide to start chasing sooner or later, I'm thinking that is a small gap for one rider after almost 200 kilometers of, pedal, of pedaling in the legs already before you're coming into the finish. Now, Ivan Ruiz from Kern Pharma, he starts digging deep. He's on the pedals. He's going as hard as he can. Now the Caja Royale rider is actually calling up his team car. Now this is, this is absolutely mind-boggling when I'm sitting on the couch because I'm watching Kern Farmer rider Ruiz go up the road attacking while the Caja Royale rider is calling his director up to the front. They're right by side by side and you can see Ruiz up the road trying to get away from the break at this point in time. I don't know, if I was the director, I'm in the car, I'm looking over at Armas Keta and I'm like, what are you doing? The rider's going up the road. We're under 13 kilometers to go. You have a two minute gap. If your legs are cramping, you just gotta suck it up. You ride as hard as you can at this point in time and try to win the stage. You have a two minute gap. When you go back to the Peloton and your Caja Royale, I can't imagine the directors thinking back there, don't worry, we got a marvelous sprinter back here that's so good, we can guarantee the stage win on here on stage two. So if I'm the director, suck it up, you're riding to your legs cramp. If, if you believe they're gonna cramp 100%, you make a deal with the riders in the break and you just say, hey, I'm happy to get fourth, I'll do what I can, I won't sprint. I have done that in my career. There's been plenty of times where I thought a general classification wasn't possible of getting, the stage victory wasn't possible to achieve. And so I looked at the riders in the front group that I was with and I just said, hey guys, I don't have it, I can't pull through, but I won't sprint. That will allow that chemistry of the three riders with Armasqueta to start working together because at a two minute gap with 13 kilometers to go, if you don't start playing games, I'm almost giving that 100% when I'm sitting on the couch. With 11 kilometers to go, it's AG2R and they start chasing back there, but they only have one rider on the front. 
Here I'm going to agree with the GCN commentator here, Roche, when he says he can't believe AG2R only put one rider on the front when the gap is still well over a minute at this point in time. Now, to my disbelief, with nine kilometers to go, when we look at the peloton with a minute and 30 second gap to the front leader up there going solo, it's Caja Royale on the front chasing. Now, I, I just can't see this. At this point in time, it's absolutely crazy. It's Caja Royale, and they have a, a rider up front that they're chasing, Armas Keta, that's in the group of three, trying to chase the lone leader from Kern Pharma. At this point in time, Caja Royale in that group of three, they can still catch the lone leader. But why are they chasing back there at nine kilometers to go? It's absolutely knuckleheism as is best. If that doesn't highlight it, what we see next with eight kilometers to go, it's two directors back there arguing with each other. Burgos BH writer arguing, I can only assume it's with the Caja Royale director that's to the left of him as we see the display here on the television. They're arguing and I'm sure it's gotta be because the Caja Royale director put his team on the front of the peloton absolutely mind-boggling and I agree again 100% with Roche when he starts talking about I don't understand why they would be chasing. They have a guaranteed fourth up the road if they can just get to the finish. They have eight kilometers to go with a minute and 30 second gap. Just get yourself to the finish of today's stage and wrap up a top four. There's no way Caja Royale stand a chance of winning the sprint back there. It doesn't happen. I don't see it anyways. But we see the argument, it just goes to enforce how much it's so strange and knuckleheadism there is within the peloton, even in the directors, when they're having their team chase their teammate that's in the front group of three with eight kilometers to go. Now with four kilometers to go, it's Quick Step that get on the front. The gap up to the lone leader is only 50 seconds. Quick Step have now decided to put all their eggs in one basket and hope that Julian Alaphilippe can win stage two here of Tour of the Basque Country. A little bit confusing to my, to my eyes because I thought their plan would have been just let the break get away, gain some time, and give up the time bonuses, but instead it's Quick Step on the front. When that happens, the time gap starts dropping down fast. Now with two kilometers to go, this was absolutely comical here. It's Burgos BH Okamika that's on the front pulling for the group of three as they're getting caught from the peloton. Now they're literally getting caught just under two kilometers to go and Okamika gives the chicken arm, the right chicken arm out for his breakaway companions to come through and take a pull. Okamika, at this point in time, the right chicken arm isn't going to help you much because the peloton is just 10 feet behind you guys and you're going to get absorbed. That's with 1.7 kilometers to go. The three up front get absorbed from the peloton. And then with 1.1 kilometers to go, it's Remco Evnipol quick step that's on the front. Now he's going to do some magnificent work here on the front because it's still one lone rider out there with only about a six, seven second gap on the peloton behind. And Remco Evnipol is on the front pulling like a madman. He'll go on under the 1K banner, still on the front with 900 meters to go. Next obstacle up for the peloton is a roundabout. Remco Evnipol goes in first, comes out first. With 500 meters to go, it's a right turn. Remco Evnipol still on the front. 400 meters to go. Remco Evnipol's on the front. Now he's caught the lone breakaway rider. Ruiz up front from Kern Farmer. He's all absorbed. The win, the victory is in sight now for someone on the, in the peloton. Remco Evnipol's on the front. Julian Alaphilippe solidly on his wheel. With 300 meters to go into the left turn with Remco Evnipol still on the front. With 200 meters to go, it's a right turn and Remco Evnipol is still on the front. This boy from Quick Step has been pulling for more than one kilometer. And let me remind you guys, there there was about a 600, 600 meter finishing climb to the top here that'll summit with about a 4% drag. So Remco Evnipol did the descent, which is incredibly difficult to do the descent before 1K going into 900, into 600, into the roundabout. That is incredibly difficult to stay on the front without getting swarmed from the back because when it's a slight descent, Remco Evnipol is 100%, but guys in the back could come around. If they get that fantastic draft, they can swarm you at any point in time. To my disbelief, it is Remco Evnipol still on the front. 
all the way to 200 meters to go when they come through the last right hand bend. And then with 175 meters to go, it's Julian Alaphilippe launches off his wheel with 75 meters to go. He's got a gap on second place. When he crosses the line, he wins today's stage two, a magnificent team win for Quick Step and Julian Alaphilippe. Ramco Evnipol started celebrating as soon as he pulled off and Julian Alaphilippe got that gap. It was a unbelievable Herculean effort from Rimko Evnipol to pull all the way from 1.1 kilometers to the finish of today's stage. He got Julian Alaphilippe all the way to 175 meters to go when the last 400 meters before he pulled off was a 4% grade with lefts, rights, roundabouts all over the place. He still managed to stay on the front. This was a display that was absolutely brilliant to watch while sitting on the couch and clearly Remco Evnipol has some form. So it's going to be exciting to see how Remco Evnipol and Primoz Roglic can battle it out on these coming mountain stages. Now with that victory with Julian Alaphilippe, he'll move up 10, 10 more seconds on the general classification. Remember yesterday's time trial, he had a bike change throughout the time trial, so he lost about 30 seconds. He gets 10 seconds back because Primoz Roglic finished further back in the peloton. No splits for the general classification favorites here as top 10 doesn't change, but it was a great race to watch. A sleeper throughout all the day. But the last 20 kilometers, nail biting all the time. So if you guys get a chance, make sure you watch the last 20 kilometers of today's stage two victory. Now, tomorrow's stage three, what do we got to look forward to? Well, near the finish of tomorrow's race, we start getting into some steeper, harder climbs. So there should be plenty of tacks from the general classification favorites on tomorrow's stage three before we get into the finish. Should be where we start getting into the real bass country classic style of racing here on stage three. So make sure you guys like and subscribe, and I'll see you guys on the next edition of The Butterfly Effect.